All right, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I guess it's still morning here, isn't it? No, it's 12.55, it's afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome back to the CMUC uh, Collision Repair and Refinish stage. We are here this afternoon. We're gonna talk a little bit about talent programming and the ICAR Academy. So we'll jump into it. I am Bud Center, Director of Technical Products and Curriculum from ICAR and... I am Dara Gora, Vice President of Planning and Industry Talent Programming. All right, so we'll just jump right in. Let's talk a little bit about talent programming. Uh, there, are, there, there are some people out here that probably don't know what ICAR and talent programming is. What, what is it? So that is a great question, Bud. In order to set the table, about a couple years ago, ICAR really jumped into trying to address the talent crisis happening in the industry. As everyone knows, we are really short on entry-level technicians, and we have fewer young people looking at the trades as being a viable career path for them. So the talent programming initiative truly tries to tackle all of the pillars that would attract talent help a shop to train that talent or a school to train that talent, and then work on retention with tools like HR best practices and mentorship guidelines for shops as well. So it goes through everything, curriculum, um, it goes through marketing tools, it goes through grants and funding um, initiatives to make sure that everything is very affordable and really tries to solve that crisis so our shops and our schools can be full of young people that keep our industry vibrant, healthy, and sustainable. That's, that's great. So I know that one of the questions that I get a lot from people is they ask me, why ICAR? Why is ICAR, ICAR getting involved in this? Um, and I'd like to tell people that it's you know, we understand the need in the industry, but we're not doing this because we're trying to create another revenue stream or anything like that. This is about collaboration with the industry and helping solve the problem. And truly, ICAR is so positioned neutrally because we are central to the industry. We are not an individual employer that if we bring talent to the industry, that talent is going to be funneled to, to shops. They'll start their career path. They may end up working for suppliers or OEMs or insurance companies based on the knowledge they get in a shop. And we're really well positioned to be able to help someone who's making career choices find the right path for them. Yeah. So what are some of the tools that are available to, uh, to the industry and to students through the Collision Careers website? So that is a, a really great question. The Collision Careers website was launched to elevate the industry. So you can find out about the different roles in the industry. Maybe you're passionate about technology and you have an interest in things like robotics or computers. Well, we can talk about the ADAS role and how you can learn the skills and the tools and the tricks of the trade to enter in, get trained, and become an ADOS technician. But on the other hand, if you're passionate about paint and you love the artistry of a vehicle, we can also talk to you about how to become a refinisher someday, how to become a body tech. So we talk about the different roles in the industry, the different ways to get trained in the industry, the different ways to access the ICAR curriculum throughout the industry, and of course, the different ways to grow once you've gone into the industry on collisioncareers.com. And one of the things I'm really excited about, of we've learned doing a lot of trade shows like this, that our school advisors don't really know the difference between automotive career paths. We'll also have print and digital materials for our school advisors by the end of this year so that they can hand out tactical brochures or digital assets to the children in their schools to help them talk about why they want to join a trade with their parents. Wow, that's, that's, that's great. So if somebody wants to get involved, if they want to collaborate with ICAR on this project, how do they get involved? Well, they can go to collisioncareers.com and there is an email address on Collision Careers that comes directly to me and my team and it'll allow us to set up industry partnerships and to really start collaborating. Because the one of the things that we've always planned to do is we've always planned to bring in voices from the industry to be able to just supply our marketing content to them and also learn from them about things that they're doing in their local markets to attract talent for the industry. We are right at the precipice of getting that collaboration started. So getting to collisioncareers.com, putting their information in, we'll start collaborating with them just as soon as possible. And, and Bud, I want to change the topic if you could. You have some really exciting things to talk about. One of the things I mentioned early on in the conversation is curriculum for schools and shops. And I'd really love you to be able to tell the audience some really sure. great uh, accomplishments we've seen there. Sure. 
So what we've done with the curriculum is we, we started with what we call a DACUM. It's designing a curriculum. And we brought together for about three weeks of time, we brought together first for a week a bunch of educators to talk about what they felt they needed in a curriculum and in the, the uh, educational tools. Then we brought in a group of collision repair shop owners and managers and spent a week with them and said, what do you need from these students when they come out of these schools? What do you need them to be trained to do? What type of skills are you looking for? And then we brought the two groups back together and spent another week with, the, with all of them together. And the room that we were in had post-it notes plastered all the way around the entire room with everybody's ideas and thoughts and what we needed to do. And in the end, the decision that they came to was that they needed from at least the entry level technician, the core skills, they needed us to get them to have skill proficiency in five areas. We needed to have skill proficiency in disassembly, reassembly, small dent repair, plastic repair, and prep for a finish. So those were the five categories that the industry told us that if you can get us a thousand technicians that have those skills, we'll take every one of them because they can come into the shop and they can be productive as long as we've got them proficient with the skills. They can come in and be productive day one. And that's what they need. We can then work with them to grow their career, to grow into additional training and, and grow into the non-structural, structural, whatever they decide to go into. But that's what they wanted us to build. So we put together a large number of real short modules that is a combination of classroom learning, but the biggest percentage of the training is hands-on in the classroom. So we put together, like I said, the, the online self-study instructor-led modules, but then every one of those modules has additional training that is lab activities, and they're scored lab, ac at lab activities, and it allows us to make sure that they have that skill proficiency. It's one thing to be able to read a book and understand it, it's something else to be able to actually do it. So we spend the time to train them on that type of, of uh, skill set. Um, we've also, as you mentioned earlier, have started working on things to help support the industry with a, an apprenticeship program. You know, things like how do you identify a mentor? You know, we all, anybody that's got a collision repair shop and has done this, I've done it for many, many years, and put together these kind of programs and collision repair shops in the past, and it's not always going to your lead tech that is your best tech, not necessarily always going to be the best candidate to be a mentor. They just may not have the right mindset. They might be too focused on production. It could be a number of things. So it's how do you identify a mentor? How do you then train that mentor so they understand the mentor role? But then also help them understand how do you manage the mentor process? You know, what do you do with that mentor, the mentee? What are your checkpoints? What do you need to make sure that you're connecting on so that they, the mentee has the right experience as well? So that it's, it's not just about the mentor and, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. I what I was trying to say something. Yes, I was going to jump in with. One of the greatest things about the curriculum that you built is um, we've already got some schools using it. They're in an early adopter program. And we're hearing from the instructors that, first of all, the students are highly engaged with the new curriculum. They love learning in short snippets and getting to go into their lab work and immediately do whatever it is they've just learned. But the other thing we know from talking to learners themselves is it's really frustrating to graduate a school program and then to go into a shop and have to push a broom or help another guy you know clean his workstation for months and months after you've graduated hoping that you're going to be let's just say you're a finished tech and this is a, a great pathway that school graduates will be able to work and immediately be valuable in a shop it's also a great retention tool because technicians who do fun work right away tend to stay yeah absolutely so, but with the mentorship program that we're putting together, if you are a shop that wants to bring in entry-level technicians and grow them from the ground up yourself, you'll be able to use this curriculum to help guide that process, guide the program, and help to ensure that you're, you're successful with that. Because like I said, any of us that have done it, it's not easy. It sounds like it would be easy. It is not easy to put these programs together and be successful with it. 
Exactly. I mean, a lot of shops, to your point, they go with the most seasoned tech to try to train the newer techs. And sometimes the person best able to explain something at an entry level level of understanding is someone who just learned it a couple years before. So as I said earlier, the, the program is right now being piloted by our schools. It will be soon in pilot with our shops. We plan to, you know, as Bud said, there's something we always do, which is plan, do, check, and adjust. So we want to make sure that by the time we get this out to the entirety of the industry, we've done it right. And we've done it in a way that really helps entry-level techs get trained and find a home in a shop. So all of the learning we're going to learn from our early adopters, the process to last about six months, will help us by the middle of next year really get shops and schools fully accessible to our curriculum. Yeah. And to add on what you were talking about with the plan, do, check, adjust, our process when we build these courses and the curriculum is that we go out to the industry, we talk about what do we need, what does the industry need us to put together, we then build the curriculum and it goes back out to a group of pilot participants that will, and it's, it's not a group of two or three people, it's a large group of, of shops and educators. And uh, I think that's what we did, just shops and educators at this point, we didn't get into insurers yet. And uh, they will review that curriculum and give us feedback to say, hey, I think you could do this a little bit different. This worked in the classroom environment for us and this didn't, so that we can make modifications to make sure that everybody gets the best experience from that. So that's, how, that's what we've got with year one. Now we start talking a little bit about where are we going with the year two curriculum. So some of the things that we heard from the industry is, hey, we don't want the inch deep mile wide process anymore. We don't want you to teach them about everything they could possibly ever hear about with collision repair, because in a, even in a two year program, they're not gonna retain it. And the reality is when they come out of a school, chances are they're not gonna walk into a shop and start welding on a customer's car anytime soon. They're gonna come in, they have to earn that trust, they have to make sure, you, you wanna know that they've got the right skill set to do that. Same thing with refinishers. You know, you're not necessarily gonna come out of a, a school and be a painter, you're gonna come in and be a prepper for years to learn what you're doing before you step into that. So as we're talking to these folks, we said, so where should we go next with year two? And the year two curriculum will be focused a little bit more on helping them understand, not making them structural technicians, but have, helping them understand measuring, anchoring, pulling, you know, the vehicle construction materials, the way things are built, getting them more of an understanding of that. We'll get into welding a little bit, not that we're going to make them come out and be welders and they're ready to go day one. Some might be I, I, I mean, some stories that I've heard, we have people come out of these schools and they're better welders than the people that have been doing it for the last 30 years because they don't have any bad habits. But uh, we're not trying to train them to the point that they're gonna come out and be welding when they come into the shop, but they will understand it. So we're going into structural, we're going into welding, we're gonna be getting into a little bit of estimating in case you've got somebody that wants to be an estimator, get into damage analysis. We'll be looking at um, a little bit deeper into refinish and understanding the refinish process. And then we're going to have a couple of things that we're going to add in there uh, for somebody that wants to go down the trail of either ADAS or EV, because we know that those things aren't going away, right? That more and more vehicles are coming out with ADAS every day, and the EV population is going to grow substantially in the next couple of years. So we're going to go down, we're going to have a path that if they want to understand that and go down that path with their curriculum, they can. And Bud, are you following the same process um, as you're building the second year curriculum that you followed for the first year? Absolutely. We follow that process with every piece of curriculum that we build. Whether it's for the academy level, the professional level, we follow the same process. We are an ISAT accredited organization and uh, we, we have very strict SOPs, a lot of them, and we follow them in everything that we do with development. Yeah, absolutely. So I am very excited to be sitting here and be able to share this information with the industry. Um, as I said earlier, the year one curriculum is already getting some really great feedback that'll allow us to make something very valuable for the industry. But but I have to ask you, what as you've talked to the folks who've been piloting the academy curriculum, what is the biggest question? What is the biggest thing they ask for that we haven't served yet? Clarify for me, you're talking about what the curriculum we about provided? About the curriculum that we've provided already. So some of the requests that we received is uh, that we provide a little bit more for the shop level people of a, a little more instruction on step-by-step -step how to use the curriculum. Yep. 
Um, we had already planned to build that. It just wasn't ready for the early adopters. And we're already hearing that that plan is the right one because the shops need more information on how do I use this curriculum and what's the path I need to follow to get me there. So that's probably the biggest question. Um, we've gotten a lot of issues, I think you said earlier, a lot of tremendous feedback. We're hearing that the, the students love it. The instructors that have contacted us have said, hey, this is so much better than what we've used in the past. And it allows me to make sure that they understand it because it's not just a, we, we do have tests that are online for the, the online portion, but they're actually able to go out there and work with them through lab activities, score them, and it's something that they can use to track to make sure that they understand how to do it. Absolutely, and one of the things that uh, Bud said earlier that I'm really excited that will be coming soon for early adopters is not only will we have the mentorship guides, how to select a mentor, how to approach your mentee in the way that's most productive, how to help coach your mentee along, but we are also um, really shortly going to be releasing what we are referring to as HR best practices for our shops. And one of the things I've learned really specifically at the SEMA is, is that our, a lot of our shops really are focused on, you'd be surprised about this, safe quality complete repairs. But what they're not focused on quite as much is interview best practices. So how to hold a consistent interview, how to assess a resume and understand whether the person joining is an entry level tech or a professional tech or somewhere in between, and how to really um, provide those technicians with an overview of the benefits that the shop offers, maybe um, 401k plans, health plans, pay time off so that the technician is aware of the benefits aside from salary of working in the shop. So we're working through some guides and best practices that way that we think will be very meaningful because people don't just want to go to work, but they want to go to work somewhere that takes care of all of their needs. Yeah, that's a good point. One of the first modules that's going to come out on the HR side is the one about building a brand. And that's intended to help shops that haven't already gone down that path understand how to build a brand that will attract these people in and want them, make them want to work for your organization, help them understand what do you stand for? What is your business, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? What are the things that would make me want to come work here? And that's, that's one of the first modules that will be coming out as part of the HR program. Yes, and that module will help with recruitment needs because finding new techs is very difficult, and distinguishing yourself from other employers that are hiring entry-level talent is something that's incredibly important for collision repairers, because at the entry level, our salaries aren't all that different from the grocery store down the street. Now, there's tremendous potential in our industry, but you have to come in the front door in order to know that. So we want to help drive that distinguishment so that we win the talent crisis and we're able to bring the new technicians to our shops rather than another career that looks like it pays the same. Low barrier to entry, but low ceiling of gratitude once you're there. Yeah, yeah so I, I did a, uh, a panel discussion at CIC a couple of days ago and we had a conversation with some students that had recently completed or graduated from a tech program. And we asked them about what drove you to the collision repair industry. And it was the typical answers of, you know, I wanted to do something with my hands. I wanted to be creative. But then we started talking about what attracted you to the shop that you went to. Yeah. And immediately it was things like the shop is well-maintained. The equipment is well-maintained and we have the equipment we need, you know, that they were respected when they came in and they weren't, you know, a lot of times you get somebody comes in as an entry level tech, if we don't know what exactly to do with them, they get stuck in a corner with a broom and then they're miserable and they don't want to be there anymore and they end up leaving the industry. By putting together these programs where they come out and they have the skill proficiency, you no longer have to babysit that entry level person and hold their hand every step of the way. You can put them on certain tasks and know that they're capable of doing it and now they're productive, so now you don't have that problem where they're unhappy. But these students were very clear to say that uh, they were looking for shops that were equipped to repair modern, modern vehicles, that it was maintained well, and that they had the, the type of benefits that people would be looking for with you know, medical and dental and vision. And you know, they even talked about, uh, for a little bit, they talked about PTO time. 
Yeah. So they're looking for that career. They're not looking for shops that they can go work at for a week or two or a couple of years. They're looking to build careers. And what I think is interesting, um, and, and I thought it was great when they said this, was that the shop being well equipped and the shop investing in additional and future training for them was very important. But taking it back to the educators, when they were looking for a place to be educated, they were also looking for a school that was well equipped, that had modern equipment, and that was able to teach them the most current collision repair technologies. And one of the other things we're doing with talent programming, Bud's team has been helping out and CREF is also helping out the Collision Repair Education Foundation with this, is we are really looking to help uplift schools. Um, there was a equipment list that was published to be able to support our new curriculum. We've been able to identify the cost of that equipment list and we'll be working really closely with, it, like I said, the Collision Repair Education Foundation and others to make sure that schools that are eager to teach the new curriculum and want to be able to get their learners ready for this new world that they're going to step into are also properly equipped. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. So I'm looking at our timer. We're about to run out of time. Oh, no. So if you had one thing, one last thing to say to the industry about the talent programming and what we're doing with our academy curriculum and the attraction initiatives, what would you tell them? I don't know if I can contain it to just one, <laughs> but what I will say is that we're still, I would say, at the early stages of this, these efforts, and there is so much more to come that we want to do with the industry and for the industry in order to uplift collision repair and make sure that it is top of mind for school advisors, for parents, for those returning from the military as collision repair being a viable and great career with a really long runway and great earning potential. And we're going to be walking the walk with the industry, collaborating strongly, and we will be there every step of the way to take away the barriers of entering this career path. All right, I think that's pretty good. You contained it into one. So, you know, for me, it would be all about making sure that people understand that anybody that is interested in participating. We're open to collaboration from all segments of the industry. We uh, encourage it. We would like them to get involved and help us along with this. So um, I see a lot of people that are nodding in agreement through our whole presentation. So I, I'm hoping we're going the right direction. But uh, you know, with that, it's the end of our presentation. So everybody, thank you for coming out. Uh, I know it's the last day of SEMA, but enjoy the last day of SEMA. If you're staying for SEMA Fest, enjoy that as well. Take care. Thank you, everyone.